I'm on my way to the most famous zebra crossing in the world. This is Abbey Road in North London. In 1969, the Beatles were photographed here for the cover of their new Abbey Road album. It has since become arguably the most famous cover in pop music history. Now, what's amazing is that it wasn't planned this way. You see, originally the album's working title was Everest, and the Beatles planned to take a private plane over to the foothills of Mount Everest to shoot the cover photograph. But they were eager to finish the album, and Paul McCartney suggested they just go outside the EMI studio on Abbey Road, where they were recording, take the photo, and name the album after the street. That's what happened. The rest is history. Sometimes, success is all about being in the right place at the right time. You can't plan it, you can't control it. But when it happens to you, you sure will know it. For the young Australian Lily Brett, being right here in the heart of London during the swinging 60s, rubbing shoulders with Jimi Hendrix, the Rolling Stones, Jim Morrison and Janis Joplin, was her right here, right now moment. Groups such as the Beatles, Rolling Stones and Jimi Hendrix created the soundtrack that was rock and roll. This sound drove the generation of social revolution in the way people thought, people felt and how people expressed themselves, but most importantly, the way people lived. Imagine arriving here from sleepy Melbourne as a young teenage rock journalist and finding yourself in the front row of one of Jimi Hendrix's first London concerts. And then meeting the man himself in his dressing room after the show. Unforgettable? Definitely. Unrepeatable? Yes, in every way. Rock and roll demolished barriers, broke down walls, questioned every assumption and embraced every possibility. We shouldn't be surprised that some of today's most influential people reference the music and message of the golden age of rock and roll as the inspiration for seeing the world differently. However, this golden age came with a dark side. Brett lived through this dark side. One by one, the then famous people that she had interviewed, knew and loved, began dying horrible, shocking and achingly young deaths. With all the money and fame came excess in every way. It was the era of sex, drugs and rock and roll. Out of this carnage came the 27 Club, the 27 Club includes the rock stars who uncannily all died at the age of 27. The 27 Club includes rock stars such as Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin and Jim Morrison. And in recent years have added members such as Kurt Cobain of Nirvana and Amy Winehouse. Through the heights of social change that was the rock and roll era, what caused these people to become members of the 27 Club? Why were these people cut short during the heights of their creativity? Are there any messages left for us and our lives? By understanding their lives, can we live our lives brighter, fuller, more creative and meaningful?
What are you doing here? What do you want? Is it music? We can play music, but you want more. You want something and someone new. Am I right? You want ecstasy, desire and dreams. Things not exactly as they seem. I lead you this way, he pulls you that way. I'm not singing to an imaginary girl. I'm talking to you myself. Let's recreate the world. The palace of conception is burning. Look, see it burn. Bask in the warm, hot coals. You're too young to be old. You don't need to be told. You want to see things as they are. You know exactly what I do, everything. This was written by Jim Morrison before he was the lead singer of The Doors. But there was more to him than many people realize. Well before The Doors, he was a poet and a filmmaker. Morrison read widely and voraciously, being particularly inspired by the writings of philosophers and poets. He was influenced by Friedrich Nietzsche, whose views on aesthetics, morality, and the Apollonian-Dionysian duality inspired Jim. Morrison would often make reference in his conversations, poetry, and songs. His senior year English teacher said, Jim read as much and probably more than any student in class, but everything he read was so offbeat. I had another teacher who was going to the Library of Congress check to see if the book Jim was reporting on actually existed. I suspected he was making it up, as they were English books on 16th and 17th century demonology. I'd never heard of them, but they existed. Morrison's stark, surreal way of using words paints pictures that to this day evokes images and emotions that break through the mundane. In his words, he could really use language to break through to the other side. Morrison lived life to the full, and with the creation of The Doors, he was thrust into the life of excess that was the rock and roll golden era. It was before Morrison was famous and the front man of The Doors that he met Pamela Corson. Reportedly, it was at the Flag nightclub on Sunset Strip. Their relationship, however, was tumultuous, with loud arguments and repeated infidelities by both parties. However, Pamela supported Morrison's love of poetry and encouraged him to develop this. Nietzsche wrote, an artist has no home but in Paris. The city, filled with cafes, theatres and galleries, seemed the perfect place for Jim. In 1971, he joined Pamela in Paris, where they rented an apartment on the Rue Beautrellis. This is where he observed and quoted, a friend is someone who gives you total freedom to be yourself. If this was correct, then Pamela was the best friend Morrison could have. Morrison went for long walks throughout the city, admiring the architecture and soaking up the energy. He took the madness of his personal life and mixed it with the energy of Paris to create beautiful, poignant poetry. Over the course of Jim Morrison's career, and with the ever-growing success of The Doors, he began living a life of substance abuse. Falling deeper into his self-obsessed life, he became more aggressive and distanced himself from those around him. Friendship slowly became non-existent in Morrison's life. On the night of June 22nd, 
Morrison ended the day by snorting some of Pamela's heroin. They began fighting again. Jim started vomiting blood through the night. And unbeknownst, Pamela went to bed, leaving Morrison overdosing in the bath. Jim now had all the freedom any friend could give him. And ultimately, that total freedom left him dying all alone. Maybe it was a premonition of this moment that inspired Morrison to pen his most haunting lines dedicated to what he described as his only friend. This is the end, my only friend, the end. Of our elaborate plans, the end. Of everything that stands, the end. No safety or surprise, the end. I'll never look into your eyes again. Witnesses reported that Morrison was hastily buried. There was no priest present, a few words were muttered, and everyone left in a hurry. The whole scene was piteous and miserable. Pamela chose the cheapest veneer coffin for Morrison's body, and when the band members sent her money for the erection of a tombstone, she spent it on heroin. Pamela died of a heroin overdose three years after Jim. She was also only 27. Morrison was a brilliant writer who's been relegated to the ranks of oldies, pop stations and the memories of fading hippies. He had the makings of a great poet. He could have achieved his ambition and left his mark in the world of serious art. However, it was a very cold, loveless, unfulfilled end to a life built on a mistaken recipe of true friendship. Today you can still find Morrison's image on T-shirts and posters and The Doors music playing on radio stations around the world. But what you won't find is a Jim Morrison friend. All the beauty of his art devolved into death, bitter recriminations and deep distrust, and his earnings going to the father that he disliked. The people who loved Morrison didn't know him. The people who did were left too bitter to love. Friendship is a blank check to be yourself. How can we know? Because that's what God gave us. God gave human beings the freedom to choose good or evil. He entrusted us with a world full of things we can use for good or evil. And today, He gives us the choice to choose to believe or not believe. So when Jim said, friendship is the freedom to be yourself, he was reflecting the exact kind of friendship God offers us. But true friendship, true love, is more than simply granting someone freedom. It's about reaching out when they're in trouble, offering them help, being there for them, giving them hope, giving them warmth, giving them healing. To put it bluntly, true friends don't supply lethal narcotics to each other. True friends don't cheat on each other. And true friends don't go to sleep while the other is dying alone. And that's the difference between God's idea of friendship and Morrison's. Because when we were lost, alone and dying, God sent His Son to reach out to us and to offer to save us, to give us everything we needed to survive. He didn't leave us to die. He died so we could live. Mm -hmm. 
Across in the UK, another prodigious talent emerged, two generations after Jim Morrison's decline. She first burst onto the scene right here. No one was expecting a retro American jazz sound to hit big in the 2000s. And even if they were, they weren't looking for it to come from, of all places, a small jazz club in London, Soho. But that was before a girl named Amy Winehouse walked in. She was tiny, she was young, and she was decidedly middle class. Not only known for a powerful, soulful voice, but also for her poignant, delicately woven compositions. The song she wrote was so personal, so honest, so transparent, that when you listened to her music, you couldn't help but feel like you knew her. The person fans got to know was vulnerable and troubled. She struggled with alcohol and she struggled with rejection. With her lyrics, she took fans into the darkest nights of her soul. And somehow when they arrived, fans felt a strange sense of belonging. And if by understanding her pain made our pain a little less unbearable. Amy first met Blake in a pub in Camden. It was love at first sight. She was a naive 20 years old. Like a moth to a flame, Blake's bad boy behaviour not only attracted Amy, but it ultimately defined her. Amy had always opposed the use of hard drugs, but the charismatic Blake changed that. Soon they were snorting cocaine together, and from cocaine, she followed Blake's lead down the dark tunnel into heroin. What I'm saying. Between the drugs and alcohol, their mutually destructive relationship increasingly overshadowed Amy's music. The paparazzi thrived on selling photos and stories of their drunken fights and drug-induced humiliations. But in the middle of all the madness, Amy's second album, Back to Black, stormed the charts, becoming one of the best-selling albums of the 21st century. The songs were inspired by Amy and Blake's stormy relationship, with the title track focusing on Blake leaving Amy for another woman. Art was imitating the very real pain in Amy's life. Untouchable souls living life on the Newspapers began to publicly express concern for Amy's health, as did her father. A photograph emerged of the pair leaving the Sanderson Hotel smeared in blood after a drunken argument. Amy's concerts degenerated into a series of embarrassing letdowns, with crowds turning nasty when she was too drunk to perform. In the midst of it all, Blake was convicted of beating a man in a pub and subsequently trying to bribe him to remain silent. He was sentenced to over two years in prison. We be. At the time, Karen Heller of the Philadelphia Inquirer put it this way, she's crashing headfirst into success and despair. A codependent husband in jail, exhibitionist parents with questionable judgment, and the paparazzi documenting her emotional and physical distress. Despite the controversy, or maybe in part because of it, Amy's Back to Black album won five Grammy Awards, a monumental achievement. For a moment, it appeared Amy's life was back on track. 
A new footage emerged that shocked even the most hardened of Amy's fans. Amy Winehouse was filmed smoking what appeared to be crack. The person who sold the footage to the media? One of Blake's mates. In Amy's biggest hit, she sang, they tried to make me go to rehab, but I said, no, no, no. The song had arrogance in abundance, but in real life, the emaciated Amy was finally checked into rehab to get off drugs and alcohol, but it was unsuccessful. Not long after getting out of rehab, Amy's lifeless body was discovered right here at a Camden home. Her body, weakened from years of intense drug and alcohol abuse, had finally given in. She had died here all alone. It's hard to imagine a woman so talented with so much to live for dying so young and so abandoned. And yet for much of the world, the reason for Amy's demise was obvious. The man she had met when she was just 20 years old. Would Amy ever have gotten into drugs if she hadn't hooked her wagon to Blake? He doesn't think so. Talking on the Jeremy Kyle show in 2013, he said, I've admitted I was there when she had heroin for the first time. It was my doing. I don't think she would have ever experienced it without me. Blake also admitted that the woman who depended on him for companionship, friendship and love was ultimately the loneliest person I ever met. In a chilling admission in a Channel 5 documentary, Blake said simply, I loved crack and smack more than I loved Amy. Amy's music gave the world a clue as to why she had fallen so heavily into drug and alcohol abuse. In her hit song, Rehab, she expressed her aching for true friendship. I don't ever want to drink again. I just need a friend. My heart aches when I share the story of Jim Morrison and Amy Winehouse. Their lives were cut short by their own choices and destructive behaviour. They should have blessed their families with love and support. They should have felt complete, cherished and fulfilled. Instead, all that is left is emptiness and the pain to go along with it. Some people think the early tragic deaths of Jim Morrison, Amy Winehouse and the other members of the 27 Club were planned as grand, romantic, artistic gestures. But not Lily Brett, the Melbourne teenager who met Morrison, Joplin and Hendrix in the swinging London of the 60s. Speaking years later on the ABC, she reflected on great artists she knew who died young, saying simply, I don't think any of the ones who died thought they would die. There was a lot of ignorance about what drugs can do. Those people had no idea they were going to be dead. But that doesn't have to be us. We don't have to die alone and abandoned by those we put our faith in. We can turn to our friend and saviour and be accepted, forgiven, cherished and loved. If you want to learn about a loving friendship with one who made you, who cherishes you, the one who gave his life for you, we'll send you a free copy of the fascinating book, Steps to Christ. 
Tens of millions of copies of this book have been read and it's available in 150 languages. I love this book and you will too. Contact us today because ultimately what we all need is a true friend. Remember to ask for your free book, Steps to Christ. There's no cost or obligation. Steps to Christ is absolutely free. Here's the information you need. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or 770 800 0266 in the United States or visit our website tij.tv or simply scan the QR code on your screen and we'll send you today's free offer totally free of charge and with no obligation. You can also write to us at GPO Box 274 Sydney, New South Wales 2001 Australia or PO Box 76673 Manukau, Auckland 2241 New Zealand or P.O. Box 888717, Atlanta, Georgia, 30356, USA. You can also email us at info at tij.tv. Don't delay. Call or text us now. Be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, let's pray to the God who cares for us and always loves us. Dear Lord, our hearts break when we remember the lives of enormously talented people who are destroyed because they didn't find true friendship. Lord, all of us are hurting. All of us are lonely at times. All of us need a friend who accepts us, who forgives us, who sacrifices for us, and who gives us hope. Thank you for being that friend to us. Amen.